Hello and welcome to episode 20 of My Friend the Rainbow Circle. Now we're talking about a different circle. Why do you keep doing this? My dog refuses to stop barking whenever I do this. Uh, we're going to a different type of circle. The Hero's Journey Circle. We're going from one geometric shape that I really abhor, um, the iceberg, um, that kind of looks the same, except that it's a triangle. Um, it has some basic validity to it, the iceberg, but I, I hate how it's applied. To another geometric shape with a line through it. Um, I have some mixed feelings about it, but I do hate a lot of the ways that it's applied. The biggest problem with the hero's journey uh, is when it is treated as a universal. Um, one, uh, one implication, um, and this has to do with some of the language that shows up in a lot of explanations of how stories work. My dogs can't help bark, eh? There's one reason I don't do this during the day sometimes. <laughs> uh, the human condition was a phrase that drives me crazy, partly because it's a cliche and partly because it's a vague inaccuracy. Um, but a lot of the times the way the hero's journey is treated, if you can ignore the dogs, a lot of the way the way the, way the hero's journey is treated is as a universal of, you know, a chart of the human condition. And that's, uh, that's uh, faulty for the same reason that I talked about with confirmation bias. So you can force anything to work within the scheme and you can call it the human condition uh, and that doesn't actually prove that that is a valid way of looking at stories. Um, and uh, there's all kinds of problems with it, <laughs> calling it the human condition, um, saying that it's the human condition because we're all, all humans are heroes and all humans go on journeys. That's so vague and broad, um, that it ceases to actually have value. Um, if I move from one part of the room to the other, that's my journey. Um, I've just decreased the value of the word journey then. Um, and another problem with the human condition as an argument for how stories work, um, and this this relates to what I talked about with Frank O'Hara. Maggie's now listening to me. At least you're not barking. Um, another, and this relates to what I was talking about with Frank O'Hara. Frank O'Hara said a poem is a communication between the poet and one person, basically. Um... And as a writer, that's a much, much more effective way to um, frame any sort of narrative that you're doing. Um, this is one of the things Kurt Vonnegut gets, right? One of the few things. he His writing is magnificent, but his advice is terrible. Except for this one thing. Write for one audience member. Um, but essentially what you're doing... It's, so if you... You know, and a lot of the Black Mountain people... Um, uh, and the New York school don't want to explain, spend forever explaining what that means if you're not unfamiliar. But Frank O'Hara was with the uh, New York school, but it relates, you know, his concept of poetry relates really effectively to uh, a lot of the Black Mountain school. Black Mountain, North Carolina was a school. Charles Olson is accredited with a lot of this. Michael McClure has a great book called Scratching the Beat Surface. Um, if I was ever allowed to teach fiction, I might do Scratching the Beat Surface as a textbook before any other textbook that supposedly is designed to teach fiction. Um, because a lot of what he talks about, a lot of what Michael McClure talks about is transmission of energy from the poet to the, to the reader. <coughs> so if you think of, um, and transmission of energy is just meaning, you know, if the poet feels an emotion, you know, the simplest way of understanding it. Uh, if the poet feels an emotion, um, he or she is trying to get the audience to feel that emotion. Um, if you say that the story stands in for the experience of all humanity, what you're essentially doing is taking the simple and practical dynamic of one writer to one reader, which works really effectively, effectively with any sort of story you're telling, and you're making that extremely inefficient because you're you're taking it from the writer transmitting it through all of humanity throughout history <laughs> all over the place and then by translating it through all of humanity then you get to the reader as if saying this is good because stop 
Be still. You're still making noise. <laughs> All my animals were quiet just a second ago, and then I started this, and they all started making noise. It, Maggie, it's the jingly color. Um, so, you know, and essentially the argument is, I like this story because it's the human story. Um, so taking what could be a simple, direct dynamic of, of uh, writer and reader... Uh, and saying the reason that the reader likes it is because all of humanity should like it. Supremely inefficient process. Supremely inefficient in understanding the story. Stop. <laughs> Stop. Okay, supremely inefficient in understanding the story. Supremely inefficient in writing the story. Uh, and bound to uh, dilute the, the actual story process. And so that's something that really infects the hero's journey to a significant degree in our understanding of how it works. It's a perfectly fine schema to use, and I've been talking about schema um, in the sense in schema just basically is a, a, a story structure with internal rules, and the hero's journey is a perfect example of that. It's one of the schema that has most writing directly about it, um, arguably, um, of all the schema, um, and it has its own internal rule system. And the important thing to remember about schema is it doesn't necessarily have a relationship with anything outside of the story. It can, it certainly does, you know, plenty of times, but there's no necessary relationship with anything outside of the story. The hero's journey works because um, of how it functions internally to the story. Um, that being said, um, <coughs> uh, the reason Joseph Campbell, you know, and... You can attribute it to plenty of people, but Joseph Campbell most famously. Um, most of you know most of the 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 setup of the schema comes from him. The reason he wrote it um, was not necessarily as a handbook for writers, and it works really badly as a handbook for writers. Um, arguably, um, he wrote it in order to understand the patterns across culture that are continuously repeat. And that's true with a lot of his books. Um, Whenever I talk about my um, distaste for the, the hero's journey, um, this comes from having uh, indulged in it uh, all of Joseph Campbell's writing 20 years ago or so um, when I worked in a bookstore. Um, the library had just happened to have audiobooks of the complete works of Joseph Campbell, and I had a big commute working this bookstore. I don't know why I commuted so far just for a bookstore job, but... Um, so I got all the Joseph Campbell books, and I, I, I was in the trenches. I criticized Joseph Campbell from the trenches. I don't blame Joseph Campbell. That was not even his point uh, in creating a writing manual. He was just recognizing patterns across cultures. Uh, and if you and one thing that gets lost a lot of times in translation, and one thing that uh, I give Joseph Campbell a lot of credit for is he he talks a lot about um, non duality. Um, the, the pattern in um, the pattern in storytelling is going from duality to non-duality, but a lot of people treat the hero's journey very dualistically. <laughs> my bird is my bird is being very noisy. My cockatiel. Um, you agree about non-duality? Um, so Joseph Campbell framed it as a journey from duality to non-duality, which is one of those sort of mind-bending things that is, I think, necessary to just get over and really understanding how story work, stories work. Um, but uh, a lot of the problem with the application of the hero's journey is also in that confirmation bias, in that if you look at, you know, the 17 elements, or if you look at the, you know, how many ever number of elements, um, and you apply it to a story in order to understand the story, a lot of it deals with forcing things to fit. Um, and so there's an indication that probably the hero's journey is not the best thing to apply to that particular story. Um, and a lot of people use it as as a map of how their story should progress. And it works just fine as a schema. So um, in the last episode, um, I talked about romantic stories, romantic 80s movies. Um, and that's a definite schema, and I do want to validate... My <laughs> My bird is getting very angry. Don't know what my bird is angry about right now. Um, <laughs> hush. All animals hush. Um, 
And it's per perfectly valid to write within a schema because it is a valid story choice to have theme and variation. So to have a structure that you write from and provide a new version of that. So it's valid to take the hero's journey and write from that. Um, uh, the problem with schema tends to be when it becomes formulaic and it functions to reduce the stimulation. So um, just having that schema functions as a mechanism of comfort. Let me, let's take a look at the rainbow circle. Having that schema functions as a mechanism of comfort. So have, at the core, you have the visceral stimulation, you have the paradoxes, and then you have the schema. That's a measure of comfort. So the familiarity of the form, the fam familiarity of the hero's journey form, for example, gives you a measure of comfort, but it could become too comfortable. Here's the destimulating end of the spectrum. It could become so comfortable that it ceases to be able to, to stimulate. Uh, and that's a lot of how the hero's journey ends up getting um, getting used. Um, um, and so, uh, and I I teach the hero's journey. Um, I have a class where we where we where we read all the Alice books and some of the Oz books. Um, here's Dorothy right there. Um, I have an Alice magnet. Oh, here's my Alice magnet. Um, and we, we take a look at uh, how Dorothy fits on the hero's journey scheme. Um, but for the most part, she doesn't fit really effectively. Um, she's a unique sort of a character. She has some moments that fit that scheme, and there's a measure of comfort um, when she... you know. And L. Frank Baum's purpose was to create a fairy tale, an American fairy tale, um, and include a lot of the familiar elements of a fairy tale. And that's part of what Joseph Campbell was looking at. He was looking at heroes in fairy tales, heroes in myths, heroes in, you know, all, all kinds of different types of stories. What sort of patterns do you get in recognition of? And his purpose was, you know, looking at the human condition. Um, <coughs> and so a lot of what Dorothy um, encounters is familiar and comforting in the sense that, um, in the sense that uh, it, it is familiar from, it's comforting in the sense that it's familiar from the structure of, of uh, fairy tales. But it's highly unique in that, you know, she has a talking scarecrow and a, a lion. Oh, the Tin Man. Oh, no, the Tin Man out here. <laughs> the Tin Man. A lot of the actual elements themselves are unique. Um, and so, um, the way the schema works, and this is the important thing to remember about schema, that third level, that third level in the, the rainbow circle. <clears throat> they work for a reason. The reason that they work is not because these story elements are universal. Arguably, they're not universal. Treating them as universal is disingenuous. In order to really prove that they're universal, really, you have to force things to work. Looking at Dorothy's story as the universal story of a hero, you have to force a lot of the elements to work when they don't really work, and it's much more enlightening to look at where she defies a lot of a lot of the, the the schematic elements. But the reason that um, the hero's journey works as a story is similar to the reason why a romantic story works as a as a story. Treating them as textbooks of how you have to write stories is highly problematic, and that's how a lot of creative writing textbooks treat story structure. Um, what they'll say is, here is here is what a story structure should be, but you don't have to follow that. You have to know the rules to break them. So um, it's an inconsistent, disingenuous sort of argument, but they're, they're still presenting story structures. And it, a lot of the times it's the literary fiction short story, story structure, uh, as um, here's what stories are supposed to be, but you have to know the rules to break them. So... What is a beginning reader supposed to really understand from that? Well, a much better way to really understand story structure is to understand why it works so that you, you can then take it apart and use it in very different ways. So, you know, L. Frank Baum is using the hero's journey story structure in a very different way and has a different sort of effect from the perspective of a writer recognizing how he does deconstruct that basic structure and recreate it uh, is really enlightening. Um, more so than just understanding that this is how stories are supposed to work, hitting these marks. Um, so one of the big 
one of the big uh, elements is is you have the familiar world and whatever you want to call this um, the you know you can call this anything you want to you have the familiar world and you have the unfamiliar world um, and what why it really works and what's similar about other stories that work in this way is that um, if you think of the destimulating into the spectrum the familiar world is destimulating. Something that's familiar, like the structure of a story, is destimulating. There's not really a story going on in the familiar, comfortable world. So, classic hero's journey story. Um, this is, uh, you know, the kingdom where the hero was born. Um, it's some young prince or, or what have you, um, who's really comfortable where he is. Um, and then there's some danger in the outside that compels him or her. Um, in Dorothy's case, it's a her. There's some sort of danger that compels them outward. And that's the call to adventure. You know, it goes in this direction, like this. Um, that's the call to adventure. And one of the classic elements of the hero's journey is the refusal of the call. And the refusal of the call is really just the foregrounding of the paradox, that second level dynamic that creates the, um, the stimulation. Um, nested inside of the schema, you have that paradox. And the paradox of the refusal of the call is just basically um, the prince or whoever, um, the, the hero, um, is comfortable in, let's, let's say there's hypothetical prince, what, what have you. Uh, it's comfortable in this familiar world, and he doesn't want to leave the familiar world. He doesn't want to face the danger, but the paradox is the moral responsibility. And some people will um, uh, frame that as saying the real important meaning of the hero's journey is the moral responsibility. You should follow your moral responsibility. That really has nothing to do with the storytelling. You can interpret it that way in, in you know philosophical terms if you want to. But in terms of storytelling, the way that really works is that the moral drive to protect the kingdom from the dragon or whatever, the evil villain, the evil wizard, um, that drives the character out of the familiar place. Um, but the paradox, the pull back and forth is... Um, <coughs> excuse me. Pull back and forth is the paradox. And that's the unresolved paradox that really drives the story and creates um, you know, the actual dynamic of the story. Um, and you can frame it in terms of maturity and immaturity, for example. So the prince is immature, he goes on these adventures and becomes mature. The immaturity drives him to be self-centered, the maturity um, drives him uh, to, you know, moral responsibility, and that creates stimulation by pulling the character in different directions. Um, and there's all these different elements, there's the temptation, and all of them are really playing out that basic dynamic of that paradox of, you know, if you meet temptation, the, there's temptation to return to, you know, the self-centeredness versus, you know, moral responsibility to others, um, facing the dragon, you know, uh, the mentors are there to guide the hero to fully embrace that that heroic responsible quality, um, and what have you. So, in the the elixir, you know, the magic elixir, um, death and resurrection, all these different elements, they're playing out that basic dynamic of the paradox of, you know, the maturity versus the immaturity. Um, or, you know, whatever, whatever dynamic is really pulling the character in two different directions. Um, so, in the unfamiliar world, is if essentially where the story is, the dangerous world, that's where the stimulation is. Uh, that's where the actual story is. Uh, once you return to the familiar world, the story's over. That's not the real purpose of the story, but that is just the end of the story. It brings the stimulation to a close. So, if you think of um, any sort of classic example, so if you think of Luke Skywalker, I don't have a Luke Skywalker uh, magnet, um, but I can use Duncan. Duncan, I think I got these from Chick Fil A, maybe. Um, but if you think of Duncan, uh, so here's Luke Skywalker in the familiar world. He's in ta ta Tatooine. Tatooine. I'm not a native, native Star Wars fan, so I'm gonna 
probably get some Star Wars stuff wrong. I love and respect Star Wars. Don't get me wrong. I am a Trekker. Uh, I have more of a distant sort of relationship with Star Wars than the super, super passionate fans. But Star Wars is an obvious example because Luke, uh, uh, George Lucas, I was about to call him Luke Skywalker. Luke Skywalker wrote it. Um, the autobiography. Um, but George Lucas read Hero with a Thousand Faces by Joseph Campbell and got a lot of inspiration for story elements from there. So, um, <coughs> so he's on Tatooine, he's comfortable, he has these dreams of going elsewhere, but he's still kind of attached to this, this life. He has this ambition of, um, of exploration and excitement elsewhere. And so then, um, uh, his aunt and uncle are killed. Uh, he has this call to adventure uh, from Leia, the message from Leia, you know, and just ticking these boxes on the hero's journey. Um, he doesn't quite have the refusal of the call. And so, you know, it. this is, it, there's so many elements like this where, um, where uh, you're not going to get a single heroic story that fulfills every single element. Um, even somebody who writes it directly based on here with the thousand faces is not going to fulfill every single element. He doesn't refuse the call because his desire is to go into the unfamiliar world. Um, but that drives him outward to this moral purpose of saving Princess Leia. And so he goes into the unfamiliar and dangerous world. Uh, there you go. Uh, with Han. And Han is a perfect example. And this is, um... Something that I was touching on last time when I was talking about the romantic uh, 80s movies. Um, uh, the likability of a character uh, is, can be irrational, just an irrational visceral response. It has very little to do with how good or bad they are. So um, the most basic definition of a hero is someone you want to succeed. And really simply, that can be someone like Luke, who has good intentions, um, who wants to save the princess and wants to defeat the Empire. You want him to succeed um, because he's likable. And a lot of that is really irrational. You can't really boil that down to a lot of rules. A lot of it has to do with visuals, the sound of his voice, um, you know, and part of that is relatability. So, you know, I would say relatability gets severely over-exaggerated. Um, if you look at the examples, like the examples last episode, um, I, you know, relate really heavily to Sam and Andy and Ducky and, and uh, Lloyd Dobler. I don't, I don't really relate to Baby or uh, Johnny. Uh, I can still you know, enjoy their story, whether or not they're really relatable. But they're likable. So relatability is really just a factor. And morality is really just a factor. So um, Han is an extremely likable, Han Solo is an extremely likable character. Uh, he's not a highly moral character. Um, I don't really personally have a lot in common with him. Um... Uh, even, you know, uh, from a fantasy level, I don't have a lot, of, you know, just a self-congratulatory, um, uh, perspective. You know, I, I find it really hard to actually find a lot in common with him. Um, his love for Chewie, I think, kind of makes him more, a little bit more relatable. Um, Siku reminds me a little bit of Chewbacca at times. Siku, Siku, you're my Chewbacca! <laughs> Siku, there he is. You're my Chewbacca. You're my Chewbacca. He's not going to get on camera. Okay. You want to be my Chewbacca? You want to you wanna dress as Chewbacca on Halloween? Um, <laughs> yeah, he's a little like Chewbacca. So, um, and he's chewing things up. You're chewy. You're so chewy. Um, Maggie, you could be Darth Vader. You could be Darth Vader. Um... And so an antagonist, speaking of Darth Vader, an antagonist is someone you don't want to succeed. Um, they can be this really stimulating, they can be really appealing, so like Darth Vader, for example. Why is Darth Vader appealing? A lot of that is really irrational, just a rational fear of him, but he's really, you know, paradoxically, he draws you in as this really compelling character. A lot of it is the mystery, 
So, you know, it's it's certainly not relatability. You know, you're not going to look at Darth Vader and say, oh, I, I feel so much in common with him. But he's viscerally stimulating on a lot of irrational levels. So he becomes this compelling character that you can hang a story around. Um, but he's an antagonist because you don't want him to succeed. He wants to kill the heroes and, you know, suppress the, the rebels and all that sort of stuff. Um, so... Uh, Luke hits all, all of these, check, checks all of these different boxes. Um, and one of the elements that just doesn't play out is the return home. So you have, really commonly, you re have a return to the familiar world. Um, and that's definitely a box that Luke doesn't, does not tick. Um, he has some resolution of the paradox of his, his uh, maturity. Um, the paradox of, you know, wanting to remain, um, you know, Childlike and personally involved and wanting to, you know, get outside of that and help others. And Han has that too. Um, through facing dangers in the unfamiliar world and what have you. Um, and that gets replaced, you know, for for Luke, that gets replaced with fully, fully embracing the way of the Jedi. Um, and one thing that plays out subtly within the whole Star Wars trilogy, that for... Um, Joseph Campbell was really important, uh, if you read all of his writing. Um, but a lot of the time when the hero's journey manifests, this is the part that gets left off. Um, so there's a return to the familiar world, that basic arc of a story where there's heightened simulation through lack of resolution of some sort of conflict. Um, and then the resolution happens and that, you know, that uh, decreases the spike in stimulation. And brings the story to the close, not the purpose, just the close. Um, for Joseph Campbell, right here, you'd have the um, the Master of Two Worlds uh, element. Um, and Luke kind of, there's, there's subtle visual hints of that by the end of, um, of the trilogy, by the beginning, essentially the beginning of Return of the Jedi. Master of the Two Worlds kind of hits right here. Um where it seems like he's facing the possibility of embracing the dark side, um, uh, while also embracing the way of the Jedi. Um, but one thing that I would say, you know, certainly Star Wars doesn't quite uh, fulfill Joseph Campbell's ultimate vision is that uh, it is very dualistic. There is a dark side and a light side. Um, one of the reasons I don't fully embrace the Star Wars um, Mythos is it is very dualistic. Um, I just personally subject purely on a subjective level. I just personally enjoy the nuance and amb amb ambiguity of um, of Star Trek than the you know severe dualism of, of Star Wars. Entirely personal. Um, so and then, but you compare that to Dorothy. Here's Dorothy on the hero's journey. Very different trajectory. A lot of what Luke goes through is pretty typical of Hero's Journey stuff, even though he doesn't tick every single box. Um, Dorothy's in the familiar world, already entirely mature. I'm talking about the book version of Dorothy. Movie version of Dorothy is very, very different. Unfortunately, <laughs> great movie. It's just, you know, it loses a lot of the complexity of the book, as most adaptations do. Even the greatest movie, one of the greatest movies of all time, still loses something compared to the book. But Dorothy's already very mature. She's the most mature character in the whole series, whether she's in Kansas or whether she's in Oz. Um, she gets swept into Oz. She gets swept into Oz. I'm going to erase some of this circle. Before John. Um, and it's an unfamiliar world, somewhat dangerous. One of the most pleasant, dangerous, unfamiliar worlds. This is going to get mangled. Um, this is green by accident. I didn't plan it that way. She goes to the Emerald City. So it's dangerous. It has witches and it has flying monkeys and stuff like that. So it's unfamiliar and dangerous. But she meets with companions. And that's one of the things that um, uh, shows up really commonly in the hero's journey. And, and Luke displays to a significant degree their helper companions and their mentors. So De Luke definitely has the mentor character in Obi-Wan and Yoda later. Um... Uh, Dorothy meets all these companion characters who do help her to a, a degree, but for the most part, 
she's the mentor to them. So, you know, the the scarecrow if I could bring him out, there you go. The scarecrow and the tin man and the lion, they all have some deficiency in some way. They have this thing about themselves they can fail to recognize, highly paradoxical characters. Um, and she she mentors them to embrace their self actualization and and value themselves and what have you. And and Dorothy by the end, she's already a master of two worlds, arguably. Uh, by the end she does return home to the familiar world. Um Arguably, she doesn't learn a single thing. <laughs> she teaches everybody else stuff, but she doesn't learn a single thing. Arguably, she doesn't change. I mean, you can certainly make an argument that she changes, you know, what have you. Um, but arguably, she doesn't change. Arguably, she doesn't learn learn a thing. She's still an extremely uh, 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 fascinating character, complicated character. Not a dynamic character, but a complicated, layered character, regardless. If you say ever say the universal... Universally good character is a complicated, layered character. Arguably, Dorothy is far more complicated and layered than, than Luke is, you know, arguably. Uh, and Luke definitely changes, and Dorothy doesn't. Um, but what a, a lot of what's really compelling about the dynamic of Dorothy uh, is her single-mindedness, her single-minded obsessiveness with getting home. Um, and what pulls her in this paradoxical direction is, is the compassion she has for all of these friends that drives her to stay in what essentially becomes a paradise. It becomes a paradise because of her influence, uh, partly. The elimination of dictators. She succeeds, you know, she succeeds where, you know, pretty quickly and easily in what Luke is trying to do, which is toppling a dictator. She topples all the dictators just with the power of her, her already pre-existing pure goodness. Um, so she's essentially in this paradise with all of these friends um, that she has created. But her overriding responsibility, which exists right from the beginning, um, to bring happiness to her aunt him, and this is you know only one interpretation of, of Oz, of course. Um, her overriding responsibility to bring happiness to Aunt M, um, the only source of happiness Aunt M has, drives her away from what is essentially gratification of her selfish desire to be among in this happy place with people who love her back to this miserable place. And Kansas is really miserable, especially in the book. It's excessively miserable. Bring her back to this miserable place. Um, and so, you know, it's taking the hero's journey dynamic and flipping it entirely backwards, arguably, in every way possible. But it's still a really compelling story. Um, and Dorothy's a compelling character. You want her to succeed. And a lot of that is irrational things. You know, you definitely want her to succeed. Even though rarely ever does she, you know, arguably, does she actually seem vulnerable. Um, and vulnerability, you know, is, is, is a good way to heighten the, you know, the, the simulation, the worry about this character that you are, this character you irrationally have this love for um, has this vulnerability that puts, um, you know, him or her in danger. You know, Luke is in danger of being killed by, you know, whoever, Darth Vader and, and, Dozens of others. You want him to succeed. You don't want him to die. So that heightens the stimulation. Dorothy very rarely ever is vulnerable. She's always in control. Um, she's far more powerful than the Wicked Witch of the West. You know, all of these different things. Yet, irrationally, you still... You know, it's, it's a hard thing to really pull off. <laughs> so, I wouldn't universalize this approach to a character because L. Frank Baum does it masterfully. But it's a way of disproving this is universal. So Dorothy definitely, even though she follows some of the components of the hero's journey, uh, perfect example to disprove that the hero's journey is an actual universal or that characters changing is an actual universal um, or vulnerability is an actual universal, you can still have a really compelling, fascinating character. My dogs are going crazy. Shut up. Uh... Despite all of these things, but the reason why she's still compelling is still at the core of the same basic thing. It's still that irrational, irrational stimulation. I don't even know what's happening right now. The dogs just decided to destroy my house and make all the noise in the world. <laughs>
<laughs> Everything's going crazy. <laughs> so, and uh, so, uh, <laughs> Dorothy functions as an interesting comparison. This just happens to be sitting here. I didn't plan it this way. I've used this as a visual before. Marvelous, marvelous land of Oz. With Tip as the hero, Tip actually, Tip actually functions as a much more direct fulfillment of the hero's journey. So you know, I, and I, um, I love to find examples of artists who clearly know what they're doing and writers who clearly know what they're doing. You know, L. Frank Baum doesn't stumble upon this accidentally. Um, he's you know he he predates Joseph Campbell, so he's not. George Lucas is following the hero's journey because he read Joseph Campbell. L. Frank Baum predates Joseph Campbell, but he's familiar with fairy tale tropes. And so he's consciously subverting the fairy tale tropes um, and succeeding masterfully. But if you look at book two, the second, the second book, Marvelous Land of Oz, Tip as a hero fulfills most of the elements. You know, he fulfills, he's, he follows a lot of the same sort of elements of the hero's journey. Um... You know, uh, there's the temptation and the flight from without, and uh, he does actually have mentors. Like unlike Dorothy, Dorothy is the mentor, um, but Tip has mentors. Um, but then uh, it reaches the the point of master of two worlds in just a fascinating way that is unlike any other story. So he's still subverting. He's still subverting the tropes and creating this amazing story. Still, still disproving. That he's accidentally falling into this, you know, it's not the exception that pro proves the rule. Another disingenuous sort of claim about any time you attack a universal, you know, they'll they'll, they'll say that. Um, uh, so conscious, consciously, you know, aware of common tropes of heroic stories, but um, Tip subverts the the um, the tropes and just. The most amazing, fascinating way, and I hate to spoil it for my millions of fans um, who haven't read Marvelous Land of Oz. One of my favorites, because it's so fascinating, for this particular reason. The Master of Two Worlds, part of it. And Tip becomes a Master of Two Worlds on multiple levels. Um, so, you know, any sort of artist who, um, if you look at, you know, like... Uh, not to bring Harry Potter into it, but if you look at Harry Potter, uh, you know, book one, Harry Potter's following a lot of the same sort of tropes. And Harry Potter has these in, internal, this internal schema that he's constantly following. It's a very tightly schematic series of books. But by the time you get to book four, it's a huge mess because you take all of the expected tropes and it, and it turns crazy. But it works really well. Book three is my favorite, of course, but... Um, <laughs> Book four, it's, it, it, all of that goes crazy, and there's so many different heightened versions of Quidditch and heightened versions of all the mysteries, and there are four dragons instead of one. Um, but J.K. Rowling knows what she's doing. She's doing it on purpose. Um, and it, you know, having a really tightly, tightly structured book like book three versus a sort of sprawling, crazy book like book four, that just proves that, you know, She's very conscious of what she's doing. She knows how to do it well. She knows how to take that schema and, and work it masterfully. And L. Frank Baum, too. You know, he he totally subverts this schema with book one. And then book, book two, he follows the schema and then drops a bombshell by the end that subverts a lot of other types of, you know, expectations. And, you know, I, I could go on and on about um, one of the most fascinating characters in, in Oz is Ozma. Um, who was very, very popular, or uh, at the time more popular than Dorothy until the movie came along and Dorothy sort of supplanted Ozma as the most popular character in, in Oz. That's probably a story for another day. Um, but uh, I will go ahead and wrap it up for today. Thank you for joining us on My Friend the Rainbow Circle. And I'll see you next time. <laughs>